Welcome to our course on the Dead Sea Scrolls. Hello, I am Professor Gary Rensberg, and I hold the Blanche and Irving Laurie Chair in Jewish History at Rutgers, the State University of New Jersey, located in New Brunswick, with appointments in both the Department of Jewish Studies and the Department of History. I invite you to join me in this course as we will study together, read together, and marvel at together the fascinating collection of ancient texts known as the Dead Sea Scrolls. In this introductory lecture, I want to provide some basic information about the scrolls, including the story of their initial discovery during the years 1947 to 1954, subsequent developments during the rest of the decade of the 1950s and into the 1960s, and indeed into the 21st century. The path of scholarship on the scrolls, and of course, the most important aspects of the contents of these ancient documents. In order to fully comprehend the significance of this major archaeological discovery, we will present the state of scholarship con concerning ancient Judaism and early Christ Christianity in the mid-20th century before the discovery of the Dead Sea Scrolls and show how relatively little scholars really knew. Only by understanding the state of research before these texts came to light can we fully appreciate how radically the discovery of the Dead Sea Scrolls has changed that picture. Most importantly, we will note how virtually every aspect of the crucial historical period approximately 2,000 years ago has been affected by Dead Sea Scrolls research, including our understanding of such Jewish groups as the Pharisees, Sadducees, and Essenes, along with the nascent Jesus movement that spawned Christianity. We begin by asking the question, what are the Dead Sea Scrolls? The scrolls comprise a group of 930 documents found at a site called Qumran on the northwestern shore of the Dead Sea. The scrolls were found during the years 1947 to 1954. These texts date to the years 250 BCE through 50 CE, a 300-year period, though the heyday of Qumran was the period of 150 BCE to 50 BCE, a 100-year slot within that longer 300-year period. The texts are divided into three groups, and I'll present for you now the number of texts as well in each of these groups, although they are rough estimates, except for the first figure, which I will give you, 230. 230, or 25% of the Dead Sea Scrolls, are copies of the books of the Jewish Bible. Every book in the Jewish canon, except for the book of Esther, is represented among these 230 documents. As a whole, this group of texts represents our oldest biblical manuscripts. Prior to the discovery of the Dead Sea Scrolls, our oldest biblical manuscripts were from the early Middle Ages, that is, about 1,000 years later than our Dead Sea Scroll documents. The second group of texts, about 250 of them, or 27% of the corpus, these texts are compositions that were part of common Judaism at the time. That is, they were read and used by various different Jewish groups during the period under consideration. Our third group of texts numbers about 350, or 38% of the 930 total documents found at Qumran. These are the sectarian works which comprise the most important aspect of the Dead Sea Scrolls, since these texts provide a window into the theology, beliefs, and practices of a unique Jewish sect in the century or two before the time of Jesus, the Roman destruction of Jerusalem and its temple, and the bifurcation of Judaism and Christianity leading to the establishment of two separate monotheistic traditions. Our fourth group consists of about 100 texts, or 11% of the Dead Sea Scroll corpus, 
These are too fragmentary to be identified as either sectarian or non-sectarian, that is, belonging to the Qumran sect or whether they were part of common Judaism. We can be certain that they don't belong to our first group of texts. They clearly are not biblical scrolls. Even just a few words, sometimes even a few letters of Hebrew would be sufficient to allow us to determine that we're dealing with a copy of the Bible. So a hundred texts, too fragmentary to be classified other than the fact that we can state they are not biblical manuscripts. And those groups together add up to the 930 Dead Sea Scroll documents. It is not always easy to distinguish between the second and third categories that I've outlined for you. Certain works may have been read by all Jews and therefore would fall into our second category, that is to say, common Jewish text, but may have had greater currency among the people responsible for the Dead Sea Scrolls, in which case perhaps they belong in category number three. They are sectarian texts. As one scholar stated, one of the goals in Dead Sea Scrolls scholarship is to identify sexually explicit literature. I hope you caught that. Sexually explicit literature. What a lovely pun. That is to say, texts from among the Dead Sea Scrolls that we can use to build our knowledge of the Qumran sect which has left us these documents. These data give you a sense of what the Dead Sea Scrolls are. But I need to say more here at the onset of our course to convey to you the true significance of these precious ancient documents. Most importantly, the Dead Sea Scrolls shed unprecedented light on both the transition from biblical to post-biblical Judaism during the last two centuries BCE and the development of Christianity as an offshoot of Judaism during the first century CE. Which is to say, nothing short of the very origins of both Judaism and Christianity at a crucial turning point in religious history, at a true defining moment, the Dead Sea Scrolls shed light on this and on much more. As you can imagine, the discovery of these documents created great excitement among scholars during the late 1940s and early 1950s, and we continue to share in that excitement to the present day. To put this differently, if you had told scholars in, say, 1930 or 1940 or even 1945 that in just a few years more than 200 copies of the biblical books from the time of Jesus would be discovered, they never would have believed you. It is against this background that one can understand the famous declaration of William F. Albright of Johns Hopkins University, the doyen of biblical archaeologists in the 20th century, Albright stated that the scrolls represent, quote, the greatest manuscript discovery of modern times. As we shall see in Lecture 8, depending on how one understands the phrase modern times, Albright may have overstated the case, but this, does, but this does not detract from the sensational nature of this singular archaeological discovery. Let me say a word about the organization of our course. We will attempt to do a number of things at once during this course as we move back and forth between and among a variety of subjects. First and foremost, we will spend a lot of time reading the actual scrolls, always an English translation, of course, with an eye to uncovering the salient religious practices and theological ideas expressed in these ancient documents. Second, in no other field of scholarship is the actual subject matter so intertwined with the story of the discovery, publication, and dissemination of the material. Accordingly, we will constantly return to this narrative which at times will read like a spy novel or a thriller, how the texts were found, how they came into the hands of the scholars, how they were published, and so on. Third, we will need background information throughout as we situate the Dead Sea Scrolls and the Qumran community in the greater world of early Judaism, the period of the Maccabees and the Roman Empire. And fourth, it was at this very time, 
that the two streams of rabbinic Judaism and early Christianity emerged. And thus, we repeatedly will note points of contact between the Dead Sea Scrolls and these two more famous religious developments. Let me now tell you something about how the scrolls were discovered. A few highlights of the entire discovery process throughout the decades. The story begins in 1947 with the accidental discovery by Bedouin shepherds in the Judean desert near the shore of the Dead Sea of seven ancient scrolls, parchment scrolls, kept in earthenware jars found in a cave in that region. Later in 1947 and into the year 1948, the scrolls reach scholars in Jerusalem and they quickly are published. Now, if you find ancient documents in a cave on the shore of the Dead Sea near the site of Qumran, perhaps there are more scrolls awaiting discovery in different caves. This was the thought process of those scholars in the early years of Qumran research. And so they set about to systematically comb the caves in the area with the help of the Bedouin, because the Bedouin, after all, know this terrain better than anyone else, certainly better than scholars who spend their lives in libraries and university campuses in Jerusalem, for example. And this led to success. Ten other caves yielded scrolls, giving us eventually 11 caves of Qumran, the original Cave 1, and the other 10 caves, now known as Caves 1 through 11. These caves gave us ancient documents, as I mentioned, 930 altogether. With the mother load coming from Cave 4, which yielded more than 500 documents, more than half of the Dead Sea Scrolls from Cave 4, though most of these texts are in a very fragmentary state. And not just written remains, by the way, were found in the caves, but also artifacts, including pottery, textiles, even the remains of foodstuffs, such as charred date pits and the like. Now, not far from these caves is an archaeological site known as Khirbet Qumran. Khirbet is the Arabic word for archaeological ruin. Qumran is the name of this region. And scholars assumed, because of the close proximity of the caves to this archaeological site, that there is most likely a connection between the two. And therefore, during the subsequent years, 1951 to 1956, archaeologists excavated the site of Qumran. We will, of course, deal with these excavations as well in a future lecture. Now, throughout the 1950s, 60s, and into the 1970s, the scrolls were placed into the hands of an international team of scholars to publish. Some of these scholars published their texts very quickly. For others, the road to publication was a long and arduous one. We'll revisit that in a future lecture as well. Now, in 1967, the largest scroll, the Temple Scroll, was still in private hands until it too finally came into the hands of scholars 20 years after the original discovery. In 1967, the largest of all these scrolls, the Temple Scroll, found its way into the hands of scholars, and it then took an additional 10 years to publish this scroll. We'll read the Temple Scroll, we'll study its contents in Lecture 14. The existence of one of the most important documents from Qumran, a text known as the Halachic Letter, was not announced until 1984. That's right, the existence of a crucial text was not made public until 1984, 30 years after it was discovered in K4 in 1954, and then again it took another 10 years until this text was published in 1994. We'll study this text the halachic letter dealing with aspects of Jewish law in Lecture 16. Finally, in 2002, scholars could state that they had completed the task of publishing all the Dead Sea Scrolls 55 years after the initial discovery from 1947 to 2002. We'll describe that process when we reach Lecture 19. Perhaps this would be a good place to dispel any misconceptions about the Dead Sea Scrolls. 
especially since these texts have received so much public attention over the years. First, while there were major delays in the publishing of the texts, as I indicated, more than half a century would pass before all the scrolls were published and were made available to the scholarly community and to the public at large. Notwithstanding those delays, there never was and there is no conspiracy of silence, as if the church or any subgroup of Christians or even Jews suppressed the material for fear that major dogmas and teachings would be upset by the revelations forthcoming from the scrolls. Sheer, utter nonsense, no truth to those rumors whatsoever. Second misconception, that an esoteric reading of the Dead Sea Scrolls could reveal the true meaning of Judaism and the true meaning of Christianity, which would completely overturn all earlier understandings of the two great religious traditions. Again, utter nonsense. We leave such musings for the world of fiction from the pen of Dan Brown and other such authors. Let me provide for you here some additional information about the Dead Sea Scroll corpus as a whole. The vast majority of the texts are written in the Hebrew language. Of the 700 non-biblical scrolls, I should state here, 230 biblical scrolls, almost all in Hebrew because the Bible is almost all in Hebrew except for a few chapters in Aramaic. So of the 700 non-biblical scrolls, 560 or 80 percent are written in Hebrew. 120 or 17 percent are written in Aramaic. And a small number, 20 out of the 700 non-biblical scrolls, representing about 3 percent, are written in Greek. Though we also need to note that the longest scrolls, with one exception perhaps, the longest scrolls are in Hebrew. So that while 80% of our texts are in Hebrew, the amount of material in Hebrew is probably about 90%. The vast majority of the documents are written on parchment, which was the main mode of writing during this period. A small number of documents are written on papyrus, and as we shall see in Lecture 22, one unique text is written on copper. Almost never are any of these scrolls found intact. Nevertheless, about a dozen of the scrolls are lengthy enough and sufficiently well preserved to allow scholars a continuous read. That is, that one can begin in the beginning and reach the end and get a coherent message being transmitted from these ancient texts. The vast majority of the texts, however, are extremely fragmentary. But a scholar with a broad knowledge of the material usually can determine the context of even the most fragmentary document. Throughout our course, I will refer to a text by a name or by its scholarly numeric designation. And then, when citing a particular passage, I'll give you the column number and the line number. Let me add a word about this. Each scroll is comprised of columns vertical columns, and in each column there are about 20 lines of text per column, more or less, sometimes a little bit more than 20, sometimes less than 20. And remember that we're dealing here mainly with Hebrew and Aramaic texts, which means that the, the direction is from right to left. A small scroll would have just a few columns, perhaps, while the longest of them, which I mentioned, the Temple Scroll, consists of 60 seven columns. It takes up nine meters. Normally there were several columns written on a single sheet of parchment and then the parchment sheets were sewn together to create the single scroll. This technique incidentally remains in practice down to the present day in Judaism in the writing of scrolls of Torah for liturgical use in the synagogue. Ink on parchment, several columns to a sheet, with the sheets sewn together to create a single scroll. There are many different translations of the Dead Sea Scrolls, though generally these do not differ in any substantive manner. In our course, however, I will present my own translations of the original texts. To give you a sense of how much material we have, the standard English translation by Geza Vermesh of Oxford University entitled The Complete Dead Sea Scrolls in English, comprises about 500 pages. 
This amounts to, say, a bit less than half the size of the Jewish Bible, or perhaps one-third the size of the Christian Bible, which includes the New Testament, just to give you a very loose approximation of the amount of material that we have here. What did scholars know about early Judaism and nascent Christianity before the discovery of the Dead Sea Scrolls? Our sources include the following texts and, and, and genres and authors. We have compositions such as Enoch, Jubilees, and Maccabees, which were not canonized by Judaism, and thus the original Hebrew or Aramaic versions of these books were lost. But these texts were preserved in various translations into Greek and Ethiopic by various Christian communities. Though since these compositions were not included in both the Jewish and Protestant Bibles, in truth they were very little studied before the discovery of the Dead Sea Scrolls. The New Testament. This is an important source for the first century, though in the main, scholars did not use these books to reconstruct ancient Judaism. Since the 1900 plus years of Jewish Christian theological tension had moved these works squarely into the Christian sphere, even though Jewish themes dominate these books at every turn. Then we have Philo. Philo's dates are circa 20 BCE through circa 50 CE. He was the great Hellenistic Jewish philosopher. He lived in Alexandria, Egypt, which means that most of his writings inform us much more about Jewish life in the Greek-speaking diaspora, that is to say, outside the land of Israel, but we will return to Philo again and again in our course. And then there's Josephus. Josephus' dates, 37 CE, dies approximately 100 CE. That is to say, he is active in the second half of the first century CE. Josephus is the great Jewish historian whose works have always been invaluable in reconstructing not only the history of the times, but also the belief system of the times. And then we have the later rabbinic corpus. This includes texts such as the Mishnah and the Talmud. But these works date from the 3rd century CE onward, and thus one needs to wonder how useful they can be for the period several centuries earlier, a topic to which we will return in our course. Now, before the discovery of the Dead Sea Scrolls, scholars typically viewed Judaism through a single lens, namely the rabbinic one, since the rabbis would emerge as the dominant stream within Judaism after the destruction of the temple in 70 CE at the hands of the Romans. The Qumran documents, however, now remind us how variegated Jewish life was during the last few centuries BCE and the first century CE. The, the result of this is a dramatic turn to reading the New Testament books as sources for Judaism in late, antiqu late antiquity. Similarly, books that were not canonized by Judaism, such as Enoch and Jubilees, to which I referred a few moments ago, these compositions aroused new scholarly interest, especially since Aramaic and Hebrew originals of Enoch and Jubilees were discovered among the Qumran manuscripts. You'll note up until now that I have used the abbreviations BCE and CE. Let me explain these terms if you're not familiar with them. BCE stands for Before the Common Era, and CE stands for B, uh, The Common Era. And we use these terms in contrast to the more generally used BC, Before Christ, and AD, Anno Domini, Latin for In the Year of Our Lord, with reference to Jesus. We use the BCE and CE terminology as opposed to the BCAD terminology because scholars of religion realize that the latter terms reflect a Christian view of the world, that everything changes with the arrival of Jesus onto the scene of history. And while that remains a historical truism, we refrain from using these theologically charged terms before Christ and Anno Domini and instead use theologically neutral terms BCE, before the Common Era, CE, the Common Era. From Josephus especially, and from our other sources, we learn of three main sects within Judaism at this time, Pharisees, Sadducees, Essenes. 
Only Josephus refers to all three groups, plus he provides detailed descriptions of them. Rabbinic texts, such as the Mishnah, suggest strongly that the rabbis are the heirs to the Pharisees. In addition, on occasion, the rabbinic sources mention the Sadducees. Philo, the philosopher, mentions the Essenes as an unusual sect of Jews, plus he refers to a group called the Therapeutae in Egypt, somehow related to the Essenes. The New Testament books refer to the Sadducees and the Pharisees, and the Roman polymath Pliny the Elder refers to the Essenes as well. Pliny, one of the most remarkable humans who ever walked this planet, Pliny was a scientist, a naturalist, a geographer, an admiral in the, in, the, in the Roman Navy. He did all of these things and he traveled the world, the known world, the Mediterranean basin of the Roman Empire, exploring and explaining the uh, natural phenomena that he saw and eventually wrote a large work called The Natural History. He had to visit the Dead Sea, of course, because he'd heard about the geological wonder of the Dead Sea, saltiest water on the earth, lowest spot on earth. And while in the Dead Sea region during his travels, he encountered Essenes, so naturally he includes reference to the Essenes when he writes up his natural history. Pliny describes the Essenes as sine ula femina, omni venere abdicata, sine pecunia socia palmarum, with no women among them, renouncing desire entirely, without money, with only palm trees for company. Natural History, Book 5. And in line with Pliny's statement, Philo and Josephus also refer to some among the Essenes as practicing celibacy. But of all these groups, the only one which has a true voice are the Pharisees, that is, via the later rabbis, which is to say none of these groups speaks for itself in the period, while the three are competing on theological and other grounds. The Dead Sea Scrolls changed all of that. Finally, we have the voice of a specific Jewish sect from the first century BCE, from a half century before the life of Jesus, from a century before the destruction of Jerusalem and the Temple. And with these texts, we finally realize how little we knew about the period, notwithstanding all of the above sources. The Dead Sea Scrolls have provided information in every area, including theological beliefs, the calendar, religious practices, daily life, and much more. Naturally, the discovery of the scrolls leads to the question, of all the Jewish groups of the period, which is responsible for these documents? Most scholars, as we shall see, will accede to the Essene hypothesis. And that is the approach that we will follow in this course. Though naturally, I will present alternative views as well, since there is, since there is far from a scholarly consensus on this important matter. I add here a word about my own personal involvement with Dead Sea Scrolls scholarship. I came to the subject as someone concerned mainly with the literature of the Hebrew Bible, the history of ancient Israel, and the history of the Hebrew language. I suppose that it was my interest in the last of these three subjects, the history of the Hebrew language, that brought me to Dead Sea Scrolls research in the first place. For as we shall see in Lecture 21, the Hebrew of the Dead Sea Scrolls exhibits some very peculiar grammatical features. But the more and more I read these scrolls, the more and more I became interested not just in their linguistic profile, but in their contents as well. And it was very easy to get hooked, for their contents are simply fascinating. In fact, for about three decades, three decades now, I have read the scrolls, taught the scrolls, and like everyone else, been fascinated by the scrolls. I am very excited about sharing my own fascination with the scrolls with you in this course. We will learn much together, and we will constantly be surprised with the findings forthcoming from these unparalleled documents from late antiquity. In our next lecture, we will narrate the story of the discovery of the Dead Sea Scrolls in greater detail. In so doing, we will present our first surprise, the fact that the Dead Sea Scrolls, the greatest discovery of ancient documents in the 20th century, first came to light purely by accident.